Welcome back to Core Conversations, a Core Logic podcast. I am your host, May Claire Bolton Smith, and I'm the Senior Leader of Research and Content Strategy with Core Logic. In this podcast, we'll have conversations with industry experts about key topics from housing affordability to the impacts of natural disasters on property. June 1st was the official start to the Atlantic hurricane season. Looking back on the 2020 season, it was the most active on record with 30 name storms, exhausting the list of names and going well into the Greek alphabet. So everyone is on high alert to see what 2021 will bring. One of the most notable trends in the 2020 season was the overwhelming impact to the Louisiana coast. Hurricane Laura devastated the southwest coast of Louisiana at the end of August, and then just five weeks later, Hurricane Delta hit the same stretch of coastline, decimating an already devastated region. Lake Charles and surrounding area was hit exceptionally hard. The city's 77,000 residents were left shocked and questioning where to turn. But in spite of this devastation and hardships, something remarkable happened. The community came together. Neighbors helped neighbors, friends helped friends, and two men, Justin Roberts and Hank Barb, both former veterans and a filmmaker and rock star respectively, were inspired by this courage and kindness. Together they dreamed up a way to share the stories of the community and create a method for people who didn't have a lot to give to still help. So for our episode today, I'm honored and thrilled to welcome Justin and Hank from Echo Bravo Productions to talk about how they helped do good. Justin and Hank, welcome to Core Conversations. Thanks for having me. Thank you, man. All right. So to get us started today, why don't each of you tell our listeners a little bit about your background? So Justin, let's start with you. Uh, I am a former Army chaplain, and but my second master's is actually in media arts and communication. So while I was in Afghanistan, I put together a film called No Greater Love, which was filmed on the front lines during combat. Wow. And when I got back... I uh, decided to settle. Uh, I married a Cajun gal, so we decided to settle back in Louisiana mm-hmm. and uh, continued working on film. Um, and that's kind of how I got here. Uh, but I happened to be friends with Hank. And uh, so when the disaster hit, we knew that we needed to turn the cameras on and start telling this story. Wow, that's amazing. So, Hank, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, too? Uh, my name's Hank Barb. I'm a. Uh... I sing in in a rock band called Three Beards. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. Uh, Getting ready to make a record, so that's cool. Uh, I was a medic in in the Army. I was in the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, one of the infantry units, a 325. And then I left there, went to flight school, and I was a flight medic and had a mission in Time Magazine, Anatomy of a Medevac. You you can look it up. It's pretty neat. At least it's neat to me, you know, uh, because, like, that's Time Magazine. Uh, I met Justin actually at an inaugural event in Washington, D.C. in 2017. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, we kind of have the, the same background. And so we kind of had some similar struggles, or at least we we weren't judgmental about each other's struggles because we could relate to it and we saw it. We knew we were, where they were coming from. Uh, so we started having this 9 o'clock morning meeting uh, every morning. And, and after a while, we just, you know, we kind of started, we'd have these ideas and then we would kind of force each other to make these ideas happen. And it became this. And I think he was down visiting me in Texas uh, when Laura hit and we were actually talking about doing this series. And then, uh, and then mother nature was like, well, you know, that's a good idea. Let's start. (laughs) Well, it's, we, so we came up with the idea and then literally like with the name and all that, well, the wife helped out with the name and, uh, but we came up with a concept of how we wanted to help. And what we were talking about at the time was, you know, veteran charities. You know, how can we help them in the midst of COVID? Because uh. a lot of them are struggling, you know, to raise money. You know, COVID sh- has shut down so many nonprofits and bled them out financially because people can't show up for, you know, in-person fundraising events. And a lot of right. people have been financially impacted. Uh, but uh. when we found out that, Hurricane Laura, Laura was coming to my home. Uh, we had to end our trip a little early and then scooch on down to Louisiana uh, to pack up our stuff and get the family out of there and, you know, board up the house. Uh, but that's, you know, when I talked to Hank, we both agreed that we needed to focus in on disaster relief first um, to, to help the community. The two of you are 
incredible. Oh my goodness. I'm just, I'm so excited that our paths have crossed and that we can be here today talking about this. So before we dive in, I, I want to set the scene a little bit. So many of us have seen hurricane damage on TV, but few people have lived through not just one, but two hurricanes in such a short period of time. So can you talk a little bit about your experiences with Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta? Yeah, you know, and I, I, I want to tack on like a couple of other natural disasters. Like we had the, yeah. what was it called? It was the, the winter uh, the freeze, right? The oh, freeze, the yeah. Yeah. freeze. Yeah. Yes, which got categorized as a disaster, uh, yeah. which Louisiana is not built for, you know, winter storms. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so just like in Texas, we froze over. We're without water for a large period of time. And and then here recently, uh, we just were flooded, uh, I think about a week ago. Um, we had two foot water in businesses and homes and 600 people were displaced yeah, and people um, who have just gotten their houses back just fixed. months and months have to move oh, out again goodness. because it's not livable it, it was the largest amount of rainfall in louisiana uh, lake charles and they recorded a uh, third top oh, the three third, the yeah. third, but this was a non-hurricane event too non-hurricane yeah, yeah it just <laughs> rained and, and then and then a few weeks ago there was a massive little squall that popped up right in the Gulf off the coast of Southwest Louisiana and took out some shrimp boats. And And there was like, uh, I think people they haven't found, I think. Yeah. There, there was about a dozen people who lost their lives and these, and these, so there's a lot of these, um, we, we got hit by back-to-back hurricanes, but then there is, there has not yet been a period of time where we've really fully recovered because we keep getting hit by these natural disasters. And for those shrimpers, that were hit. Uh, I know that United Cajun Navy was trying to do the rescue operations. They were working out with uh, the the Coast Guard, I believe, you know, searching for those bodies, but they're, they're still, that's an ongoing thing. And then we got hit with this recent rain, which displaced 600 people, you know, flooded 600 wow. homes. So going through all that, I mean, like this is still literally a week ago, I was having to drive through, floodwaters trying to get my kids out of their schools great video before they the, flooded over on the facebook page and on the YouTube and page, there's great you, you would think that. you would think that our kids were going to be traumatized by that but they were actually having a blast you know it was just a <laughs> grand old time and um but kids are resilient they are they are this is like my, my three-year-old son he's like this is the greatest thing you know you just you saw his eyes light up and you know, we had water like flooding into our floorboards and i was just praying the engine wasn't going to stop and and he's just having a blast but yet yeah, there there hasn't been a time to uh recover yeah from these disasters because it, it's just ongoing and ongoing but for us the Hank was over there just shortly after, so he could speak to it just as much as I can. But um, for me, my my home, uh, the roof got wrecked, which flooded in water. So 75% of it's gutted right now, still, oh, eight months still, later. Wow. Um, it, my office was destroyed. My car had a, a branch fall on it, so it got destroyed. So it's been just nonstop back to back and um but uh luckily i had a good friend from texas mr (laughs) hank barb drive down and uh we we kind of had to put my life in in kind of the recovery efforts for my own home on on pause so that we could actually capture these moments because these moments pass by so quickly and uh so we immediately turned the cameras on and you know and i um, i I can tell you when i when i came up and it is up. I had this argument with his with, uh, with his father in law because I, I instantly Antonio was going to say down. <laughs> yes, yes. There's actually uh, everybody thinks Austin because I'm a, a musician. Well, Austin is technically even with uh, Lake Charles. San Antonio is south, okay. so up. Okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so uh, I, I remember when I came up there, I was really not prepared for the damage that that there was. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, Justin was in Afghanistan. I was in Iraq, you know, and I was in Iraq right after we had, did the shock and awe in Baghdad, you know, 
And Baghdad was in a lot better shape than Lake Charles was. Uh, there were, I, I remember there, there's a bunch of smaller cities around Lake Charles. Uh, and uh, one of them is uh, Cameron Parish. And Cameron Parish was just decimated. Like streets that had were lined with houses, you couldn't even see the foundations because wow. the houses were gone and debris was covering anything that was concrete there. Wow. Yeah, you know, it's it's so interesting because I think again, like people people see this on TV, and I think no one, unless you've lived through it, you don't think of the extent of the damage and how long it takes to recover from that damage. Um, I, I want to circle back to something you said, uh, Justin, you mentioned the Cajun Navy. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah. So there's this nonprofit, the United Cajun mm-hmm. Navy. They're just assemblies of volunteers who mobilize for wow. disaster events. And so they responded to Hurricane Laura, um, Hurricane Delta, and you know, most recently these you know sudden storms. Mm-hmm. that happened off the coast that just wrecked the shrimp boats and also I think knocked out a rig. Wow. Um, so they were helping in the recovery efforts. And um, so it's, it's amazing volunteers who mobilize. That's it's so amazing. So I, I just commend both of you for not only surviving through this, but a getting excited about having an opportunity to help other people and, and really thriving through this and, and making sure that you were doing all you could to help to help people. Can you talk? You've mentioned a little bit about Do Good, um, the documentary series, and and how you knew that you needed to do this. Um, can you talk a little bit about how it came to be? You mentioned it just briefly, but how how did it came, come to be, and and what does it mean to you? It's, I think for us, like the idea of do good was how can we mobilize uh, just the audience to tend to, you know, these oncoming events, these, these, you know, disasters that are happening. How can we bridge that gap that the news often doesn't cover? Yeah. The story dies down so quickly. And what happened like with Hurricane Laura and Delta, you know, that was in the middle of a contentious election, you know, so there was right. all of these you know, getting news on a natural disaster and the impact was so difficult. So the objective is to tell the most powerful stories we come across. And both of us were soldiers. You know, we saw heroes step up when traumatic events were happening, you know, when, when lives were being lost, we saw heroes rise up and they always do. And so we knew that with these disasters, heroes were going to rise up again. Yeah. And the goal became to tell their stories, to honor them, and then to raise direct support for the people who are making an impact. Um, yeah. So that that was the conception, the idea behind Do Good um, and what we tried to do with these disasters, which, you know, like we thought, you know, we came across so many heroes, so many incredible individuals who stepped up in a very desperate time. I mean, like what a lot of people in America don't know is that we were without water and power for, for over three weeks um, wow. in the middle of a heat wave in Louisiana. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and so yeah. sweltering heat, mosquitoes, all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, you had both the rich and the poor, you right. know, just trying to find food. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Even if you're a millionaire, you know, yeah. they, they were in the food lines, too, because all of the food – that they had went out. Then right. once you clear out your pantries, you're done. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, you know, speaking of the food, you know, there was, that was the one thing that I noticed was there was food on just being given away all over the city. Uh, I, I think that, I think Sam's club, the yeah. Walmart gave us, gave, or didn't give us, gave, when I say yeah. us, the greater Lake Charles, like $200,000 worth of meat. And, uh, it's unbelievable. We, wow. One of the one of the the coolest, or at least to me, the ones that stood out that we went to, you know, there was a general surgeon out there just working with all the other people. You can tell who was who. Uh, the guy that was kind of running the whole deal, he was a uh, a general manager for McDonald's. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that they did was instead of hey, how can we open our store? 
to to start serving customers again, the first thing they did was they housed their employees and a lot of them in the house with the G, the general manager. And when they went to work, they went to work feeding the community. You know, they didn't have electricity or, or they didn't have ways to do whatever, but there were lines of people and they were just giving out sandwiches. Yeah. See, the, this is what's so important about what you guys have done. Like by making this documentary, you're bringing the life as it was to the screen so that people can see what actually happens and how people come together to help. Like the only thing you ever see on national media is here's this bad storm. Oh, the storm's over. Oh, look, it was bad. And that's it. Yeah. It goes away and there's a new news story a day, a day or two later. So mm -hmm. I, I love what you've done, how it just really brings to light because this is not unique. Like what happened in Lake Charles is happening in many communities around the country and around the world when disasters happened and and it happens all the time and no one talks about it and no one sees it happening. And I, I just love that you're bringing light to a finding a way to help people and get people to help each other when they want to help, but really just kind of showing people it, it's, it's just amazing what you've done. That was a big thing that we noticed like here in this community that Lake Charles felt forgotten yeah and everybody saw it like we just weren't making the headlines and that was like so traumatic but that also started making us ask the question like well what other communities have been hit that we never even heard about definitely you know and, yeah. and how often does this happen it it seems to me that you know in our news cycles right now you know the media is going to talk about what is getting traction and attention and yep. so gossip and and division and all these other things often they're going to hit the headlines because it sparks interest it's like a schoolyard fight you know it, it gathers a crowd and everybody kind of circles around it so it's the most viral conversations often get to the top or the things that kind of spark that that type of interest but it's often not the most critical conversations we need to have yeah. and so we have to more artfully construct these stories to where we can have these critical conversations. Yeah. And, and so if we have to be better storytellers to get these stories to the forefront, uh, yeah. because if we don't have these conversations, then we suffer incredible consequences. Like the disasters in Lake Charles did not have to happen in the way they did. We can't stop the storms, mm -hmm. but we can better prepare for them. Mm -hmm. And so that is the conversation we need to have as a country to save lives to mitigate damage, to mitigate loss. You know, if we don't have these conversations, then we're all going to be struggling. And with the rise of frequency and severity yeah. of these disasters, this is at the forefront of the conversations we need to have. Yeah, because, you know, it's, it's hard to prepare when you don't have time to recover. Uh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And, well, I it, it, and yeah. you don't even know. I mean, a lot of people don't even know that this is a major issue. And yeah. so their community is... It's, it's in the sight line, like yeah. somewhere in Florida, somewhere along the coastline, up in New York City. They're in the sight line for a disaster. But right now in the media, it's not being talked about. It's not a subject. Yeah. It, it's not something that's at the forefront. And so they're not preparing for it because they're not really conscious of it. Yeah. Now, if we can get that to the forefront, then we can actually do something about it. Absolutely. And, you know, at CoreLogic here, one of our tag phrases is know your risk to help accelerate your recovery. And I, I love that you just said that because I I, I want to give a little bit of context on how our paths crossed and how uh, we became involved with Do Good at CoreLogic. So it's, it's a bit of a funny story because Justin, just by coincidence, happens to be friends with one of our colleagues here at CoreLogic. And the, the two of them met when Justin was filming one of his previous documentaries about, of all things, a Baja motorcycle race. Yeah. And so as Hurricane Laura came down, our, our colleague John Hodel checked in with Justin just to see if he was okay and if his family was okay, knowing where they lived and knowing the path. And then it really just, the rest is history. Like I still remember the day that the email came in saying, do you guys want to be a part of this documentary series? And Rhea Tarakia, who's our executive producer at Core Conversations, she's like, we have to do this. And we just got so excited about it. And it really became from our perspective, how we can help 
is with that data and analytics of natural hazards and natural catastrophes. And we really, I mean, there's so many people from understanding the impact of climates and disasters and and the homes that people live in, like we have that data and we can use that data to do good really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for so many people in this industry, myself included, like the, the rewarding part about what we do is helping people. And for me, it's all about helping people understand the risk that natural, natural hazards pose to them so that they can prepare. It's just what you said, Justin, that the event is inevitable. It's going to happen, but the disaster doesn't have to be like, we can help mitigate and prepare for something. So it's not as bad. So, so once we got involved, um, it initially, there's no one else we would have wanted involved other than our chief scientist, Dr. Howard Botts, who is one of my favorite people on the planet. And if anybody knows him, he probably is there too. Uh, before, I forget, before I forget, yeah, you mentioned about uh, the data and how you guys can predict damage stuff, right? Mm. Uh, y'all ran one on my house and you said, your house is pretty safe, except <laughs> for maybe your septic tank. And then bam, my septic tank went out. And I was like, <laughs> we got spies. <laughs> but I just had to bring that up. But yeah, Howard Botts is awesome. I, I think last time I talked to him, I was trying to convince him to get knuckle tattoos. I think that's oh going to be a no-go, but <laughs> I tried. Uh, well, yeah, no, it's it's funny because I think most people think of disaster preparedness as hurricane coming, board up my windows. That's how I can prepare. But there's so much more that you can do than just like boarding your house and buying sandbags. Like, can you talk a little bit about how once you had other than just your house, Hank, once you had data and insights about the knowledge and and what that meant and, and how important it is really for preparedness? Well, well, for me, one of the things it did was it made me feel pretty secure. You know, mm-hmm. I live in the Texas Hill Country. Uh, I'm, there's not, a, I'm about, I found out I was like 1600 feet away from the floodplain. So I'm not worried about that. Uh, <laughs> 1600 feet floods don't go over top of barriers. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah I'm I'd worry. I'd worry. The thing is, I know what might happen. Like and going back to Lake Charles, you know, that Lake Charles is prone to this type of event. So mm-hmm. these are the things that you need to prepare for, for that event, you know, and, and having that data and the and the historical evidence, you know, and then the evidence is like uh, Chappie keeps bringing up the frequency and intensities going up. What was we asked? Uh, Doctor Botts told us uh, like every year the amount of damage almost doubles, yeah. right? In in dollar value, yeah. And that's crazy because it was like fourteen, twelve billion, twelve to fourteen billion with a B damage in Lake Charles. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that because there's actually data from NOAA, which is the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, that has shown that over the past four decades, we've seen a 70 to 90 percent increase every decade in total inflation adjusted losses for weather events in the U.S. And this trend isn't slowing down. What's interesting to me and well, not just interesting, what's worrisome to me is just the the shift of all this you know, with these disasters, yeah. you know, uh, we're, we're on our fourth natural disaster in this area in less than nine months. And it's not sustainable is the problem. It's like not something that we can no longer weather, Yeah. you know, just South of us, there is this small town called Cameron and Cameron is where my father-in-law is from. It's where we would do our Thanksgiving Uh, our Christmases, it was a small, you know, bayou type town, you know, on the marsh and uh, just amazing personality to it. And it's been around here for, I think over uh, in America for over 150 years, 200 years. Wow! And so the, the early Acadian settlers came down and they settled in Cameron along, of course, all along the Louisiana coastline. And so it has an amazing history to it. And so for over a couple hundred years, They've been shrimping. They've made a life out there, farming, doing rice, hunting, you know, so it has an incredible history to it. But with these recent disasters, you, you know, you had Katrina, then Rita, you know, these back to back things that was, you know, many years ago, but those hit and hit Um, before that was Audrey. And so with each hurricane, the population just decimated, moved away. 
So it went from being a small suburban town to even mm-hmm. smaller to even smaller. And then here recently now, um, do you have a few trailers? Um, they used to have the shipping industry there. It's barely holding on. If that they see the writing on the wall, that it's not sustainable and they yeah. are, you know, so there's no real community left there. And what was tragic was that uh, my wife's grandmother thought that she was going to be going back. You know, they rescued her out of there before the storm hit. And she assumed that, of course, she's going to go back. She was born there. She had her first kiss there. She raised her children there. All of her life and community was there. So, you know, she's in her 80s. She assumed she's going to go back because wow. that's where she wanted to finish you know, her life. And um, there's nobody to go back to to take care of her. It's, it's no longer sustained. So the death of an American community. Yeah. And how can we weather this? You know, we yeah. have to figure out these solutions. And the only way we can do that is with information yeah. and, uh, and having a conversation about it and then starting to plan. Because if we have, that's just, you know, the first community that I know of, you know, along the Louisiana coastline. Yeah. What's I'm the sure next one? Others. Yeah. 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 If the severity is increasing and the frequency is increasing, who's next? Where's next? And also, uh, Cameron is the third largest um, natural gas natural gas distributor. Oh wow! Um, it In provides a vital shipping. I mean, uh, a vital shipping lane force. So it's a, one of the largest deep water ports uh, mm-hmm. in the Gulf, mm-hmm. and it is a part of a ship sh- shrimping <laughs> industry. But yeah, I mean, like you know, it's a vital food industry there as well. And so, you know, that's one community that actually has an incredible impact on America that is, you know, on the fringe, you know, where is going to be next? And and as we lose these communities that are playing a, a vital role in our infrastructure and our economy, um, it's going to have an effect across the country. So it's a conversation we need to have. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I think many times, especially with hurricanes, as they're heading towards the Gulf or even the Atlantic coast, you know, you, you often hear, oh, there's nothing there. So it's not a big risk. Like it's not like it's barreling towards New Orleans or to Houston or towards Galveston. Like when it's not a major city in the direct path, people think it's okay. It's, it's not going to be that big of an impact. But there is something there, whether it be an industry like people often focus on the offshore oil platforms. But I've never heard anybody talk about the shrimping industry before and the impact that will have. Like there are businesses, there are communities, there are people there. And and I love that you're bringing light to something that's not a major metropolitan center because no one ever has these conversations. So it's it's so important. I remember when when uh, when Delta was coming, we were still like trying to survive in Lake Charles, you know, trying to make Mm -hmm. sure that when that thing comes, we can get the drainage and all this other stuff. And then when the news was talking about, and it was heading right at us, like it wasn't coming to, it wasn't just random Southwest Louisiana. It was coming right at us. And on the news, when they talked about it, their concern was about potential flooding in new Orleans because of it. Yeah. And it's like, we're right here, man. Come on. Yeah. Exactly. So, so I, I guess, you know, as we move into the 2021 hurricane season, which is just started, uh, what are you, what are your thoughts? Like it's, it's so, I mean, there must be a lot of anxiety given everything you've been through, not just with the two hurricanes, but just the, the flood recently and, and the, the winter storm. What do you think is, is Lake Charles and even other communities, are they ready if another hurricane hits? No. Yeah, yeah, it's it's there's there hasn't been a, a massive overhaul in preparation. Yeah. And part of they haven't had the opportunity to do it. Yeah, it's like we, we haven't even there was such a so many homes where 95 percent of homes were impacted. Wow. Uh, so getting an influx of contractors, getting the insurance stuff worked out in a timely manner, all this stuff. It's just a massive delay. It's a massive bottleneck. And I think industry-wide, we're going to have to have a conversation about 
how to process these things in a more timely manner, but also how can we mobilize more contractors to get this stuff worked out sooner? And uh, how can we start building in a different way? If yeah. these storms are going to be hitting harder and faster, how can we have roofs that can survive, you know, this type of wind speed right. and uh, making sure that, you know, our buildings and our homes can withstand these storms in the future because uh, it won't be sustainable if we don't. And, and, I, th and I think it can be done. You know, uh, when I was in the military, I did a lot of stuff. I was, I was in the Marines even before I was in the army <laughs> and I was in Okinawa and I brought this up with Dr. Botts. They had seawalls, right? And these seawalls kept the, the surge off. You know, and their, mm -hmm. their buildings were built to withstand these typhoon condition winds and storms, you know. And uh, when I'm going to the rural parts of Louisiana, I'm not seeing those buildings that are going to withstand storms. I'm seeing people who live in trailers. Yeah. I'm seeing people who live in tow behind trailers, you know, fifth wheels and stuff like that. Part of it is the poorer the region is, the harder it is to prepare too. Right. Yeah. It's one of my favorite words is resilience. And that's really what you're getting to is mm -hmm. how can we not only get through a disaster, but thrive through a disaster? It, it is inevitable. It is going to happen. The event is inevitable. It's going to happen. How can we make it so that it's not excruciatingly damaging? And then how can we get through and not just survive, but be stronger in the end. And, and what are those things that we can identify to, to really help to, to be resilient? I think it, I think it helps having a team of scientists like CoreLogic does, <laughs> you know, to help figure out and solve problems. Well, we're here for you. I mean, you guys are family with us now. So <laughs> I, you know, I, I feel like I could talk to you both all day, but I, I do want to make sure that we tell people how they can watch how they can help. Hank, you also referred to the uh, Facebook page at one point in time. So can you talk and can you talk a little bit about, first of all, how can people watch do good? How can people help do good? Um, how can they contact you or find information about you guys? And then what's next? The, the best way for them to get in contact with us is to go to the do good army on Facebook and like, that page and that immediately gets it to where they they hear about the latest news uh the latest videos that we have coming out but also that's where we're trying to organize you know we're not trying to raise a fan base we're trying to build an army that can activate to these disasters and so that way they can find out about all of these different nonprofits. there's multitude of nonprofits. this is how you can you know look at the buffet of options that you have to be able to make a difference and then jump in and whether you like volunteer your time, able to donate or just spread the word, you can make an impact by joining this army. So go over to Facebook and join the Do Good Army. Um, also to see our latest videos, go over to YouTube and look up Do Good. You'll see our ugly mugs up there. And make sure when you go to the YouTube channel that you like, share and subscribe. And subscribe. Because yes. We, yes. one of the things that we're doing is we have we've teamed up with the uh, United Way southwest louisiana and so all of the streams that when you know youtube pays their creators for streams but yeah. the way we have it set up is each episode whatever we're featuring whatever wherever that episode is designated the united way is going to pay that out to that chair to that charity or that individual Amazing. so even if you don't have any money to contribute just by watching and sharing it you're still contributing money uh it's awesome and it's just also raises awareness. You know, we these are the conversations we need to be having as a country. And whenever one of our communities gets hit, you know, have to go all for one and one for all. Mm -hmm. And so this helps us to to raise awareness, raise direct support for the people who are making an impact, and to also recognize the heroes who do stand up in the midst of these events. So that is the two ways they can get plugged in: is just go into Facebook, mm -hmm. Do Good Army, and go to YouTube and just look up Do Good. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I'll make it easy for them, too. You can also go to corelogic.com slash do good, and we will connect you to all of those places. So, um, Justin, Hank, thank you so, so much. This has been so wonderful. Thank you for being a part of our podcast. And thank you for joining me on Core Conversations, a CoreLogic podcast. Well, thanks. Thank you, guys. And thank you to CoreLogic for you yeah. know, supporting this and, and just being a, a powerful ally.
and I, I, same, I'm, I'm grateful for our partnership with CoreLogic. But I did want to mention that if, if you guys want to get to know Justin a little bit better, you go to Amazon Prime and his movie, No Greater Love, is, yeah. is out there on Amazon Prime. And it kind of gives a good view of who Justin is. Fantastic. And also, if you want to hear some amazing music, <laughs> go to Three Beards on Facebook and check them out. Spotify, Pandora, everywhere. The Spotify, Pandora, you'll be Love rocking. It. <laughs> well, yeah. we need to be rocking. So thank you both so much. So for more information on the property market in the housing economy, please visit corelogic.com slash insights. And again, for more information on do good and how to watch, visit corelogic.com slash do good. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed our latest episode. Please remember to leave us a review and let us know your thoughts and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to be notified when new episodes are released. And thanks to the team for helping bring this podcast to life. Producer Rhea Tarakia, editor and sound engineer Romia Roman, and social media guru Mike Wojcik. Tune in next time for another core conversation.